Well, this morning we're going to go to Craig Moor. We've told me doing this for a long time. Well, so this is just a little snapshot of where we're going to go to. So, <coughs> I always start off with so. I must remember to change my starting procedure. Anyway, it's pretty steep going up here, so I'm not sure how long I'll be able to talk before I sound like a strangled bagpipe. As I said, we're going to find Craig Moore this morning. Penny and I. So whilst we're looking for it and walking to it, as I said, as I'm walking up here, I'm going to read you a story. That was inspired by Faulty Will and my father. So sit back and walk with me. Listen to my tale. The Avery Scales. It was the year of the scales with every farmer and soldier taking up the offer. The sale lad Sam Killier was a smooth operator. Not from farming stock you understand, but he knew their ways. He could sell anything, even persuade a crofter with a tile roof to buy some thatch, just in case. Anyway, the deal on the scales was simple. Sign up in the spring with a 10 shilling deposit. The remainder would be collected at harvest time in oats or barley to make up the difference. Sam was in his 30s, very plausible, always talking, persuading and cajoling. Tall man, never married, although his nickname was the housewife choice, if you know what I mean. The scales started arriving in the summer months. Everybody was pleased with their purchase and the deal offered by Sam. He even came around and set them up correctly, made them level and checked that they were weighing exactly to the ounce. Harvest time was fast coming around and the crops were looking good with plenty of ears and strong straw to match. Once the harvest was gathered in and all the stacks were covered, it was time for the harvest Thanksgiving in the little chapel. It was full to the door with hymns ringing out and laughter in the rafters. The night after the harvest, the festival was traditionally a sale of produce, with a local auctioneer, Jack Tear, standing in the pulpit, shouting at the top of his voice, a bunch of carrots here, a crocker here and there, a dozen brown eggs, large white loaf, still warm, and the biggest pumpkin anybody had ever seen. The big Bidding for the pumpkin started and it quickly reached two shillings with gasps from the audience. It was shyly sold for two shillings and three pence to Barton Quilly, the shopkeeper. He promptly offered a prize to the first man to lift it above his head a penny ago. Profits to the little chapel. Well, the local lad stepped forward and put down that penny to have a go, huffing, puffing, straining, all to no avail. Various methods were tried, lifting from the knees straight up. The sweat was pouring from all who tried. After an hour, the old pumpkin was getting a bit soft and ripe, looking the worse for wear, when up popped Sack. He was the biggest lad in the district, a really nice lad who would help anybody, but not the brightest shilling in the pack. He stooped down, picked the pumpkin up as if it was a turp, and with a mighty shove, littered it over his head. The audience went wild and clapped loudly when the strange thing happened. There was a squelchy sound and then Sack's head disappeared into the, company, into the pumpkin. Everybody just stood and watched, rooted to the spot. When Barton shouted, Get it off him before he smothers! With a shout, the lads dived in, lift the pumpkin up and Sack <sighs> dropped the floor with tears running down his face. None the worse for the incident. Tommy Cashin brought the turkey. It was a beauty weighing in at 22 pounds exactly. He was donated by Woods the Butcher and the last item sold. The congregation slowly headed for home, all with tales to tell. 
The next day Mrs Cashin got the turkey out of the cold safe and just for fun put it on the Avery scales. She then looked quite perplexed, it only weighed 20 pounds. When Tommy came for breakfast she told him about the turkey. Now Tommy was a straight man, would not diddle anybody and likewise did not like being diddled himself. So he's got his coat and cap and set off towards the butchers. When he arrived at home Mr Woods was serving a customer. Hey up Tommy says Charlie Woods, what can I do for you? With any preamble, Tommy says, this turkey is not a 22 pound bird. Charlie Wood looks puzzled. Pop it on the scales and we check it. Sales scattered at like slightly over 22 pounds. Tommy was taken aback. Went on to explain to Charlie about the Avery scales and the scheme hatched up by Sam Killier. When the penny dropped. They realised that Sam had set the scales up to wonder away. So when he collected his corn, he would collect more than he was entitled to. Tommy was annoyed with himself, but a plan was hatched. He asked Charlie to spread the word, but discreetly, and the meeting was arranged at Tommy's farm. On the following Sunday, over 20 farmers had taken the sales offer, and Tom explained the plan, and once they had got over there, and it was agreed. Charlie, vis Charlie Woods would visit each farmer and reset the scales to be two pounds heavier. The thrashing started in October and carried on to Christmas. After each farm was finished, Sam would turn up and collect his dues. He couldn't understand why the farmers were so happy to hand over the grain so freely. Normally collecting debt was a challenge. Nobody ever found out what happened when Sam went to sell on the set like sacks of grain. <sighs> Some say he had to pay the funds himself, others say he was chased out of the district. One thing is for sure though, those area scales are a bargain and are still in use on some farms today. Hope you enjoy that folks, we'll carry on up the hill now, on our way to Craigmore. Looks like that many people use this track. Hopefully we're on the right one. I do love this time of year. And the leaves on the ground and the colours. And uh, it's just beautiful to be out. And now today it's the middle of early November. I haven't even got a coat on. A few messages from various people involved with the stuff I do which is encouraging so I said can we show you or can I show you where I've come from okay, aren't the colours just beautiful subdued lighting really suits the day I think at the end of this track which is fine eventually you know, there's a way along to Craig Moore we plan to do this one for a long, long time. Although I put all this stuff on YouTube, I don't get paid for it. Nobody sponsors me. So I don't have to actually kowtow to, kow to any rules other than my own. Likewise, my opinion of things is only mine. It's really steeper than the last time I remember. Coming up here. Oop. It'll be a mountain goat, really. For the faint hearted. Whether this would be classed as a shortcut or not, I'm trying to join up with a more substantial path. I'm hoping this appears somewhere.
this would have been the road in from the Drither Road. And this is the way we're going. I'm reminded of the, uh, the seasons and I was talking to somebody the other night about it and uh, when I was a kid I've told you before, it doesn't matter, I'll tell you again working on the farm most of the winter the ground would be frozen and we had to get picked up for the uh, cows and stock into our cart we have to have to kick them out all the water sauce would be frozen, we'd be carrying buckets of water everywhere. But I don't remember that weather anymore. We get rain and wind and stuff I used to have, but we don't get frost. Now I don't know whether it's climate change or just the world's um, evolving. But I definitely know. Weathers are less severe. For those of you who know me will find it strange I'm up here this morning without a coat of any significance. I can just see the beech tree, beech leaves rustling in the background. Absolutely divine to be here. Such a lucky man. I've got to be careful because it's very easy to walk past this place. Don't be fool. Oh, I think we'll just go up here and walk through the trees. If you're looking for habitation, you know, these little rooms, always look for these hedges and stone walls. And it'll be somewhere near. Come with me through the trees, as they say. And uh, I can just see stuff in the distance. Which hopefully will be what I was looking for. Some tales to tell for you up here. And uh, some of them are true, some of them are not true. One is definitely true. The um, story about the quails getting shipwrecked off Jerby Head was apparently that is true according to the news museum. And out uh, of all the farms up here, from 1500 till the 1930s, quails lived in this place all that time. Close to uh, 400 years or 400 years of generations of quails. It's a 90 acre farm. Although you don't think so today, it would have had a beautiful aspect out over the hill there. And um, lots of little buildings on it. Just 
just look at the way the uh, moss has sort of taken over everything. Eh? Gives it a sort of an eerie thing to it. And um, I think the spirits for fetch me to this place, for letting me find it, talk to you about it. If you ask them nicely when you're here, they'll always give you a surprise. This can be sound like a complete crackpot. That one in front of you is the uh, house, the one with a chimney on it really. It's got some, some unusual details which you'll find out as we come into it. Got to find the well as well. Oh, <laughs> well as well. It's around here somewhere. For those who ask me, that's where I came from. Last time I was up here, the roof was still on it. And in that little shed there, I got the biggest fright of my life. I'm going to tell you about it. I did like this when my camera went in, it was pitch dark. And the roof was obviously still intact, and then um, I was peering around as my eyes were getting used to the gloom. Standing looking at me in the corner was a woman in a brown overcoat, completely still. Now, expression, shit yourself, it's a horrible expression, but that happened to me that day. My heart was pumping like it was going out of my chest. Once I regained my um, equilibrium, so to speak, got my breath back, I did examine it, and it was like a, a mannequin, a showroom dummy. And somebody brought all the way up here, they deserve a medal for doing that. And put it in the corner, and it was this, it was there to frighten you, it frightened me. The next time I came up here, it had been shot to bits on the hedge somewhere. Maybe that was his original plan, eh? who knows. And I've, I've already told you, the quails came here because they did get shipwrecked off Jerby Head and they swore if they ever survived they'd leave the sea as far behind as they could. So this is where they came up here. So every one of these farms in Doddy Will was a quail farmed for one for a long time. So now I'll show you where they uh, got their water from. This would be a daily trek every day. Kids would be sent up with buckets. Go and get the water, boys and girls, go and get the water. And whenever I've been up here, that's never been dry. Never. Do a little bit more exploring. There's also some tombstones up here. Lots of people were buried, I think. I think there must have been a whole family wiped out. I'll show you where the graves are too. Isn't that just divine, eh? A little cart shed up here. And cart it would have to be because there's no other way out of the stuff. This is one of the biggest lentils I've seen. And they must have had plans to make this into a gate post, haven't put a hole through it. Unless they're going to hang a gate in this little shed, or this little cart shed anyway. And you see there's two stones over there, just above the um, gable end. I would imagine they may be for what, shall we guess? Hang on the, the harness on maybe? Maybe I'm being a bit romantic, eh? Ah, uh, tombstones. Let's see if there's any inscriptions on them.
There we are, 10 people. No inscriptions. Somebody did say to me it was the last coronavirus outbreak. They got all these um, graves ready, but they didn't need them in the end. They didn't need them. Seriously, folks, they're not graves. I'm just taking the mickey, really, as you probably know. When they were quarrying up here, they were, these things, these big stones, would be kept. Gate posts, lintels over sheds, fencing. They were never broken. If they came out whole, they were kept whole. And generally speaking, I'll find them in a lot of places buried in the ground like this, so they know where they, where they would find them. Killerbrake has a stack of them as well. And Killerbrake is just next door. Now, Craig Moore means Great Rock. There's about 90 acres in total, as I said. And for three of those genera generations, Johnny the Craig lived here. Well-known local individual. You know, when you take your time to do things, as I can do as I retire, you learn so much more than rushing around and snapping and walking away. I haven't seen this before, but I'll just show you something in the bottom of this wall. A little effort they've gone to, eh? A little culvert, possibly. It won't let you be a culvert, it's a bit too low for every uh, lamb gate. But even so, the effort and time to put it there. Let the water run away rather than into the sheds. Commendable. Another one of the little sheds. This one had like a, looks like a pitched roof to me or a flat roof. Again, it's details when you take your time. See there, a little lintel in the ground and then below it the stones are filled in a hole. I wonder what that would be here for. Eh? Here to let the chickens out maybe. Let the dog go run out and free. Who knows. Obviously got filled in eventually. In the 1880 census the family quails obviously lived in this place and they only spoke Manx. That's all they spoke. And um, the guy who lived here was John Quail. Still using an old-fashioned old flail to, to thrash the oats. And um, two women lived here. They spoke Manx too. We only, only Manx. Surely family relatives. Apparently they got the train to Ramsey once and were absolutely petrified of that fire-breathing monster as they called it and vowed if they got home safely they'd never leave again and they didn't. The little hidden views you find when you poke your head in the doorway eh? You all know what those stones mean these days don't you? You experts like me now That's a great view of Ballisk. And just uh, up to the left of that is the um, Block Erie Dam. And behind that, just up to the right, is Block Erie Farm. We must do that sometime too. Anyway, the reason for doing this video, or this little bit, is to show you. In 1896 there was a large snowfall up here. And they say Johnny the Craig could walk straight from here to that farm without touching the ground on the snow. So the whole valley was full of snow. I remember doing that at home, so the brick once we had some thorn trees in our yard and um, the snow came down and filled them up and I was walking along the top of it. And I was about six or seven, I suppose. And it was ten foot deep, I suppose, too. My father came in and saw me, gave me such a lathering for being such a fool. Because obviously you drop through snow, you're gone, aren't you? Another place there is called Slough Manic. Another one needs to be visited and put on tape, I feel. So we'll take a walk around the outside the house now before we go inside. Sorry about the jerkiness, I'll try to keep as still as I can for you. Camera's quite good at it, but I'm not as good as I could be. It's quite an interesting detail this place. If you get up here to see it, sam it yourself and make your own ideas about what it's built for and how it was built and why it was built the way it is. We've met the front door of Mrs. Quail. And Mrs. Quail was a genial host, always cooking, there was always cakes and scones on the table. So, 
lots of little uh, things to explore in here. Though one of the strangest things is this really is like a room around the fireplace. And there's various conjecture over what it was for and what it was uh, used for and so forth. But I really think that this little bit was built afterwards. See the size of that lintel? It's unbelievable, isn't it? The moss just adds a magic to it, doesn't it? It really does. And above that you've got the chimney stack. Taking the smoke away from Mrs. Quail's fire. The 40 other enders fell in. Not sure whether they would have had a fireplace there. I think it probably would have done. And then there's a little alcove in the corner there. Two actually. One up here. They tell me most of these would be for keeping salt. No. What did I tell you? When you explore you always find things to look at. That's one of the little spirit sculptures, I think. And these were posh folks because this window here's got an alcove built in. You wouldn't normally do that with your building just to survive, would you? I'm sure you wouldn't. So you get a better idea of the uh, house or inner house. The general consensus is that when they were dynamiting or whatever they were doing up here, they would have put uh, another wall inside a house like this. There's a few of them around here. And the dynamite would be stored in there. Hopefully when it, if it did explode it came out. Not through the doorway but was sort of kept under control. Again, it's just conjecture. Just conjecture. I don't normally do this but I think up here it's just worth doing it for you. This is a video panoramic of the area. Today. So it's early November. And I'm up here. With a coat. Not on me. All I can hear is the chuffs. It is magic up here. Not too difficult. It's a steep hike up, but I'm sure the kids will love it if you've brought them up here. It's free to roam. It's Ramblage country. We own it. We can look at it. It's been well protected over the years because of the trees. Banned in the 1930s, I believe. And back to where we started. This little place here looks like it would have been a pigsty. In the old days pigs were always part of the food process. Yet what everybody else couldn't eat, turned it into meat. Such detail and trouble they went to to build these places, didn't they? Look at the colour of that tree today. So many shades, from green to brown, and anything in between. Just awesome. I just love the way the uh, moss and ferns are taking over the top of these walls. It just needs painting by somebody who can paint. Well, folks, I hope you've enjoyed your well, my trip around Craigmore. I definitely would recommend it. It is a beautiful place. The way I came in is the quickest way, but it's the steepest way. <clears throat> You can park up on the Duradale Road and walk down the path through the forest of Felty Will. And um, you'll find it. But be careful, it is easy to miss. As I know to my cost. So um, I would suggest you got the kids out one weekend. Come up here, a few sandwiches. Pay your respects to Mrs Quayle. Be polite, leave no rubbish. Just enjoy the trip. I'm sure you'll find it a magical experience, which I do every time I come here. 
So a few other facts <clears throat> about the um, place and what I found on the various um, publications. William Quayle found a body near his farm of a young man in 1893 which gave me a bit of a shock. The guy's name was Benson, he came from Stoke-on-Trent. Not sure what happened to him but suicide seemed to be the um, word of the day and also maybe to do with them. Um, Full own love, shall we say. All well, the quails are buried in um, Blaff Church, the Zer Church, some of them are buried in Braddon Cemetery as well. And in, William, in 1913, William Quail died, leaving no um, next of kin. He left an estate worth £1,500 in those days. That's 180 grand a day, and he left it to a trust, the Zer. For the poor in Lazare. Amazing. So there was money in farming those days apparently. And uh, the farm was then sold in 1918 by Crystals to a fellow called Captain Wilson. And he paid 255 quid for it. 90 acres. 255 quid. What's that? Four pounds an acre. <laughs> Today that's 21 grand. A bit of a bargain. Came for sale again in 1920 when it was um, described as part of a large shooting estate of 800 acres. And uh, next door to here there's a place called the Chapel Field and there they found quite a few graves as well. That was in 1930 and in uh, 1939 the uh, plantation was started. 100 hectares Hectares is planted up with various um, trees, as I would say. And uh, they're in the process of them all taking them down, I think. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed that little escapade to the up here. This is one I've been going to do for a long time. And um, it certainly is absolutely divine. I'm just imagining today up here, it's November. The mist is coming in and it's not too nice but without the trees I can see Killebrega to the left, Balamish in front of me, Slimanic just in front of me, Balaskelia to the other side of me, on top of the hill behind me and to the right there's um, Craigans, Corridy and behind me is the other video I've done in Sherrick Vane so they'd all be within distance of each other, all see each other. So on this heyday there would be hundreds of people working up here, hundreds of people. And now it's just me and Penny. Isn't that right Penny? Anyway, it's time for lunch I feel. Meander back the way I came. Show some of the uh, show some of the footage on the way back, because that's what I've been asked to do. So this is the way we're going. Back to the car park. Doesn't know. Oh, don't those trees make a beautiful colour, don't they? Just divine. I wish I could paint sometimes. Photography's all right, and I love doing it. But when you paint, you paint the essence, don't you? Definitely this is the best time of year for doing any sort of videoing or photographing. This lighting is even better than uh, bright sunlight I think. The rain sparkling on the rushes. Wow. How lucky am I eh? How lucky am I? You can see what nature does when these trees fall down. You know, nothing's wasted, is it? The moss crawls all over it, rots it down, decays into the ground, nutrients for the other trees, and away we go again. Nature's just incredible, I think. You know, we think we're so powerful, don't we, us human beings? 
So if you decide to have a fart, I'll be gone. History. Nothing sure than that. History. So for all you uh, people who worry about the, the future and what's happened to the world and what we're going to do about it, never fear. Mother Nature's here. So here before we came, let's be here when we're gone. She'll never be defeated, no matter what we think. Right, well that's the path we just walked up to Craig Moore. We've taken a shortcut to come back. And uh, that's the path again going around and back out. So you can't get lost now folks, I've shown you every way of getting here. 